Well, good afternoon. I think we'll get started. Good afternoon and welcome to Front Row with the faculty at St. Joseph's College of Maine. So pleased to see so many alumni and friends, friends of the college, those who have joined us today simply because they're interested in loons and our wonderful and beautiful campus here on the shores of Sebago Lake. This session is being recorded. We will post this on our website. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Joanne Bean. I'm the Vice President and Chief Advancement Officer. And there's three other colleagues with us today that are very instrumental in this session. Um, Stephanie Filer is our Director of Alumni Relations. Ashley Maloney is the Development Officer and Event Manager, and our Chief Brand Officer, Oliver Griswold. So all three of us, um, aside from me, are here to help you enjoy this afternoon. And want to just go through some housekeeping points before we introduce our speaker. Um, I think we're all sort of familiar with Zoom, and certainly that's the way we're communicating and entertaining these days. But want to remind you of a couple things. We do have a chat function and we ask that you enter your questions there. That would be um, nice for us to kind of look at them going through the presentation. But then also you might feel more comfortable to ask a question after the talk. Uh, and you can do that when there's a pause or a lull uh, after questions have been addressed and answered. So um, I ask you all to please, um, I see many have, mute your microphone. Uh, that helps just with the speaker presentation and the background noise that could easily happen. And if you're not unmuted when you're asking a question, we'll probably remind you to take that uh, stop off the microphone. But for now, I think we're ready to get started. And I'd like to introduce our featured speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Jim Perok. Jim is going to talk to us on what do common loons do in the winter. He is an associate professor of biology at St. Joseph's College. He's also an adjunct professor of biology at the University of Southern Maine and an adjunct senior scientist at Biodiversity Research Institute. For the past 10 years, he has studied the winter behavior and ecology of the common loon in California, in Louisiana, in South Carolina, and here in Maine. And many of you might have heard him uh, many times on uh, Maine Public Radio. His talks are always entertaining and I think we're in for a really nice presentation this afternoon. You should know that he has an upcoming book that will be published uh, in May. And the book is entitled Loon Lessons, Uncommon Encounters with the Great Northern Diver. This is published by University of Minnesota Press. And so stay tuned for that wonderful book coming your way. Dr. Proke has 25 scientific papers published on loon behavior, ecology, and conservation. And I asked all of our uh, professors to give us a little bit of that we might not know about them. And interestingly, you should know on the Saturday before his undergraduate college graduation, he ran 50 miles in nine hours because he read Bobby Kennedy did this before his college graduation. And so he was inspired to challenge himself to do the same. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jim Peru. Jim, please get started. Great, thank you, Joanne. Hello, everybody. Welcome, you're here to come out and talk about loons. We feel very fortunate to be able to talk about loons. And I'm excited to share what I've learned that over the last 10 years about these birds with you. And I thought just before I get into it, I would just give a little perspective that for the last 10 years full time, I've tried to study loons in the wintertime. As Joanne mentioned, I flew down to Louisiana, South Carolina to study loons. And oftentimes I would be down there two to three weeks during the course of the winter, sometimes six weeks. And I would spend oftentimes being a field biologist eight to 10 hours in the field. And I was looking at the number of days that comes out to about 20 days, I'd say on average. And if I'm working about 10 hours a week, I came up with literally about 2000 hours of watching loons in the winter time. So that's how I've been spending a good chunk of my last 10 years learning about loons. So I'm gonna share with you some things I've learned at the end, I hope to generate lots of questions. And as you're going along, if you have questions, write them down, keep tabs on them. And if I can't get to them during today's chat or during our conversation, I'll answer them at some point for you to the best that I can. So before I go on, I wanna thank a couple of people.
And just one second. So I've been fortunate to work with many people and I can't express my gratitude to these folks who've contributed so much to the Loon Research Projects I've been working on over the last 10 years. Darwin Long, which I'll mention him again in a second. Hannah Yorkook was a former student of mine who just had such tremendous positive energy in the field. Uh, got so much work done and it was just a delight to work with her. Brooks Wade I worked with in South Carolina, tireless effort, uh, loves, loves loons. And then Jay Mager is another colleague of mine that I've worked with for over 20 years. So these folks, these folks contributed greatly to this research. And down below is a picture of a bunch of volunteers. I've been fortunate to work with Earthwatch, an organization based in Boston that funds research that scientists are collecting and gets, student, gets uh, citizens involved in that research. And I've had over 150 volunteers work with me in the field since 2011. So without their help, we wouldn't have advanced the science of loon winter ecology as much as we did. The photographs are predominantly by Darwin Long and Daniel Polischuk. So I'd like to acknowledge them at the start. And funding for the last nine years has been through Earthwatch Institute and Gulf of Mexico Research Initiative. So how did I get interested in studying loons in the winter? It started, I was at a conference in St. Paul, Minnesota in 1997. Darwin Long came up to me. Uh, I was an adjunct professor at Chico State University at the time. I had been doing uh, breeding ecology work on loons and thought, hey, I would love to do something in the wintertime. So he lived in California, just north of San Diego. And he noticed loons were down there in the wintertime and thought to develop a master's thesis with me to study loons just north of San Diego in a place called Morro Bay. So I went down to Morro Bay, took my students, showed Darwin how to catch loons and how to work on a behavioral study. And so going back to 2003, Darwin and I have been collaborating ever since then. So the outline briefly, I'll we'll go over some natural history of winter time. I'll talk about some tools of the trades that we use. I'm gonna present some data that I've gathered on behavioral observations on loons. And at the end, we'll have time for some questions, I'm sure. So let's dive into it. So most of us love loons. Who doesn't, right? They're just gorgeous. Uh, the black checkered, black and white checkered markings, the necklace, the red eye, the haunting calls of loons we just love. So when they lead our, leave our breeding lakes, what do they do? Well, here you can see a loon that's molting. So this is a bird that's in September. It still has its breeding plumage, but the head is starting to molt, for example. And then in the winter time, they would have lost all those feathers. So loons off Portland Harbor right now are in winter plumage, non-breeding plumage. We can see they have no necklace, no markings on the back, and they are easily overlooked at this time. So this is a picture of an adult loon, and we need to separate adults from subadults. And so what I'm looking at here is the red eye, not as red as it is in the breeding plumage. You notice white on the side of the face, kind of a more pronounced collar, a white cheek patch. But what you will notice on the back are the scapular or back feathers have a square notch to them. So that tells me that's an adult loon in contrast to a subadult loon. So a subadult loon, we're looking at the side of the head, we notice that it's brown. The light, the eye may not be as red, it lacks a distinctive collar. And we notice if we come in closer that the back or scapular feathers have a rounded edge to them. So that makes it a subadult bird. So loons throughout North America are predominantly born in July. So by seven months of age in January, that bird is about seven months old. A year later, it's 19 months old. So when we're watching loons right now, we have first or second year birds, and then we have 31 months or an adult loon. So it takes a couple of years for it to get the adult winter plumage and breeding plumage. So this is a test. Ah, are we looking at an adult or a subadult? And we're looking at this and I'm looking at a little bit of white here, a little bit of a collar, but I'm mostly looking at the feathers and I can see there seems to be a square edge to those feathers. So this would be an adult loon. So this helps us biologists in the field to distinguish between adults and subadults. Now this is very odd picture. I'm sure you're all looking at this and what are we looking at? 
Well, this is a winter adult loon that's molting its wings. So during the midwinter, January, February, loons will molt their entire wings. And they, so they're flightless at that time. And in fact, loons remain flightless throughout the winter and they molt their wings. And this is just necessary because there can be dirt and debris, there's abrasion and feathers. And so this just helps to keep new clean plumage. Most of us know loons are piscivores, they eat fish, they're opportunistic. So in the winter time, certainly they're eating fish. We see them eating crabs, the occasional lobster. One thing you may not know is they also have a salt gland. So just sitting above their eye is a large gland and that helps and serves a bit like an additional kidney to help deal with salt loads. So if you have too much salt in your diet, it can be problematic. And so they have a salt gland to concentrate that salt and to kind of spew it out over their nostrils. So we can keep a list of fun facts we've learned. That might be one of our fun facts that we've had. So most of us are wondering, where do loons go in the wintertime? Well, I'd like to know too. Uh, and that's why I'm in Louisiana and South Carolina. The loons go south. But do our loons in, Minnes in Maine, how far south do they go? So a way to look at this question, there's some tools. We can ban birds and recite those bands. We can use radio telemetry or satellite telemetry. So let's look at some things that I've used. So the way you catch a loon in order to put a band on it is here's a technique where you go out at night, you use a marine battery, you attach a million power candle power light to it. You have a large dip net, you approach the loon, you produce a whale call. And the idea is that the loons on the breeding ground freeze on the surface and you're able to scoop up one of the adults. So the success rate of this is very high. It's literally 95%. So when we go out at night to catch a loon, if they have chicks, our success rate is literally 95%. In the winter time, we don't have that luxury. So this is showing you a picture of the bands we put on the loon's legs variety of colors. And the silver band I have highlighted there is a nine digit number that should the loon be found, that's registered with the federal government with an office and they would know where the loon was banded. So as banders, we have to report every band we put out on a bird and they notice, they, they keep track of it. And should it show up on the shores of South Carolina, we would get that information. We take a variety of measurements when we have a loon in our hands, for example and then we release it. So this is me back in 1993 releasing, releasing a loon that we've caught on the breeding lakes. But in the winter time, it gets much challenging. So by catching loons and putting out a whole bunch of loons and bands, we can then get recoveries. So this is some work that Biodiversity Research Institute did. This is from New Hampshire. This is like uh, up on Lake Umbagog. And we can see the loons went from almost like Penobscot Bay all the way down as far as Cape Cod. Loons in uh, Squam Lake, for example, in New Hampshire, were pretty much off the coast of Massachusetts. And I'll show you a few more pictures. So in terms of reciting these birds, most of them went to the uh, uh, East Coast and up and down the coast of Maine, a little bit along New Hampshire and Massachusetts. So catching loons in the winter is challenging. You're going out in a bigger body of water. I want you to notice a really long handle dip net because in order to get close to the loons, uh, we use a really long handle dip net to scoop them up. And our success rate is about one in five. So the loons dive before we can approach them. They don't respond to vocalizations. So if we were to play a call to get their attention, they're really not interested in that. So we put in a lot of hours to try to catch loons to ban them or gather other data from them. So in Morro Bay, mostly Darwin caught 80 loons, adults and subadults. And in Louisiana, our team caught 124 loons. So to give you an example, that's over 200 loons we've caught, gathered interesting data on, and put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in order to make those captures. And what we found is that the adults returned to the same spot where we caught them, you know, in the neighborhood of 80% of the time. So if we we're gonna catch a loon off the coast of Maine, Odds are we're gonna see that bird 80% of the time next year in that same spot. Subadults, less or so. It seems that subadults have not established yet where they're going to stay for many years. And this research was published in an article in 2015. 
This is the first time anybody has seen these slides, by the way, or together. So this is working with Darwin. We caught this loon in 2004. Here's a picture of it in 2005. This is the same bird fed, uh, captured in 2019, the same, uh, same bird, same bands. And this bird is returning to Morro Bay for 16 consecutive years. I have birds in Louisiana that have been coming back for six or seven years and in South Carolina for five years. So I think once a loon establishes itself, this is where I'm gonna spend my winter. They're gonna come back there year after year. Okay, so now we're looking at some other uh, tools that biologists use. This is radio telemetry. So we attach this radio transmitter to a band and it's actually on this loon, you cannot see it. It's actually the band is, the, the antenna is underwater, but this allows us then to track movements. So where, where do the loons go? And we're able to do this, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico in the ocean. If you're trying to locate that loon, you're trying to cut down on your search time. You're trying to be efficient with your time. And so using radio telemetry is a very useful tool to do that. And this is me using the same tools in South Carolina. So we're able to locate loons, we're able to demarcate their range, but it's not as useful to track long distance migration. For that, we need satellite transmitters. So satellite telemetry has been around for a long time. Now for eagles, they actually put them on a backpack. For albatrosses, they put it on a backpack. For loons, that wouldn't work. They swim underwater. That would disrupt their hydrodynamic ability to swim through the water. So we actually put the satellite transmitter uh, inside the loon, inside the body cavity. We hire a vet certified to do this. And this is what it looks like. So you have an antenna, very flimsy antenna that sticks out from the posterior end of the animal. This now sends a signal up to our satellites where then we can download GPS coordinates and we can track these individuals where they are through the year. So a very useful tool. Disadvantage is they're expensive. They're roughly, at the time, they were around $2,000 each. And of course, it's invasive to the animal. So we did this in Maine for some loons up in the Rangeley Lakes area. And this was in 2011. And what the loons did when they left is Ziskahas and Flagstaff Lake, the males, they flew right to the coast. I'll show you a picture, roughly 120 to 140 miles. Females from the same area, flew further to Massachusetts, Maryland, and New Jersey. So let me show you a photograph of that. So this is where the birds were caught. And then this is where we found them. And they were here all winter long. Females were down by Cape Cod, Indian Pond, uh, and down by Flagstaff Lake, uh, down by Maryland, for example. Now this was some research that another loon biologist did using satellite telemetry Again, finding loons from Umbagog, we're up along this whole area of the coast, and ones from upstate New York varied as well from Massachusetts through Connecticut down to New Jersey. So if we're wondering where loons go in New England, they're gonna to go to the coast, mostly around Massachusetts or south of Massachusetts, for example, but probably not too much further. Now, what we were able to find with some of the satellite telemetry that some of these loons are 10 to 50 miles offshore. So some loons are close to shore and some are a long distance away from shore. So what you're looking at here is an overlay of two consecutive years. So this was a loon from, uh, I think this was from Flagstaff that we caught one winter and the dark picture here is where it moved and where it lived throughout the winter in 2011. And the overlay is 2012. And you can see for both of these birds, they returned to the same area as they did the previous year. And if we map that area out, what we find is they probably covered 20 square miles. And I was in a boat one time following a loon in the ocean and that loon swam on the surface for four miles. So, and it probably went to another foraging area. So loons at this point, again, are flightless. They can't swim. They can't swim up to four miles, uh, even like in an afternoon relatively easily. And they come back to the same area year after year. 
So what we're seeing is that if you're again looking at Scarborough Beach, Ferry Beach, and there's a loon there, that loon's coming back year after year. So how do they spend their time? Well, oftentimes loons in the wintertime are preening. And this is vitally important for them. So nine to 12% of the time, loons are preening all their feathers. They roll over on their belly. They do this in the summer, but in the winter, it's probably even critical for that. And the reason is keeping those feathers zipped and tight is how they maintain you know, thermal neutrality. It's how they prevent getting stressed or too cold. So off of Portland, if you look up temperatures in the ocean, it's 36 to 42 degrees, ambient temperature 13 to 31. So when we're looking at loons in the wintertime, I'm assuming like you're like me, is this individual stressed? And we know water conducts heat faster away in water than air. So it's very dangerous. Let's say if we were to plunge into the North Atlantic, for example. So for loons though, everything I can tell is they look completely comfortable. Even when it's really cold, I haven't noticed that they feed more. It doesn't look like they're stressed. They look like they're thermally neutral, like they're very comfortable. And that's astonishing when you think about it, right? But then if you compare it to another animal, maybe it's not so astonishing. Remember emperor penguins in Antarctica? All they have are feathers. They might have a little more blubber than loons, but they survive these extremely cold temperatures. And what I've noticed a bit with the loon feather that there seems to be a little more inner layer similar to an emperor penguin. That's like an additional feathers that might help keep in heat, for example. So the reason they preen is they need to keep all those feathers tight so water doesn't seep in and get to their body and cool them. And this brings up something about oil spills. So why oil spills are dangerous is the oil disrupts the feather mechanism. So that allows water then to get right directly to the body and an animal can freeze to death. Okay, so we're all doing well, having our chips and salsa, having some water along the way. So loons spend most of their time foraging. So they have high metabolic rates. They constantly need to eat just as we do in the winter as well. And roughly 55 to 65% of the time they're foraging underwater. Kevin Keenow put some depth loggers on bands and was able to re-catch these loons. And what he found was that loons were making dives 120 to 180 feet down in Lake Michigan, feeding at benthic prey. So we know loons can dive to 180 feet. We've seen them at 200 feet with cameras uh, in commercial fish nets set that deep. So we know loons can dive 200 feet, possibly even more. So how long do they stay in the water? Typically most dives are under two minutes, but they can stay comfortably anywhere between two and four minutes long underwater. So what do loons eat? I think they're opportunistic, what, what's ever available, for example, and that's what we find on the breeding grounds. So fish, probably slender fish, smaller size are easier to manage than a real large fish. They do feed on crustaceans. As I mentioned, here's one feeding on a crab. And in Casco Bay, for example, probably smelt, alewife, capelin, mackerel, I uh, listed tommy cod, black bass, other species as well. So they'll take advantage of what's available. They will feed on lobster, probably not uh, with high frequency, but they certainly will surface with crab. And we're still trying to sort out if they have a preference for one crab species or another. I haven't seen that, but that might be something down the road to, to investigate. So now here's a loon, an adult loon. We look at the square feathers, we see kind of a collar. They rest roughly 12 to 23% of the time, depending on where geographically this bird is found. And it spends roughly nine to 14% locomoting. So just swimming on the surface, maybe between foraging areas, uh, investigating new sites. Now loons do something interesting in the winter time is they will raft as a group. And so all in the open ocean, they'll start calling and forming these rafts. I suspect one of the reasons to do that is security in numbers. Um, and oftentimes if you move offshore, 
you're away from the influence of tide. So in case if there was a storm, you wouldn't want to get pushed on shore. So this is an area that's, we've just been starting to investigate the formation of rafts, but I've come across rafts in the ocean at night that have 200 individuals. So sleeping as that large of a group. Oh, I should say this, I have to just get this in by the way. So when you're catching loons at night, it, it can get really cold. And the coldest I have ever been has been catching loons. So it has been no picnic, no vacation catching loons in the winter time. Uh, I, I guess as a field biologist, maybe I'm getting a little soft as I'm getting older, but it is certainly very challenging conditions at night catching loons. So I've been interested in how do loons forage? Is, is there any particular strategy that they may use? And early studies showed that loons were predominantly solitary. So even if you go, to our, go down to our coast today, most of the loons you see are solitary. And they're probably feeding throughout the water column, but close to shore, it's easy enough for them just to dive 10 or 12, 15 meters to the bottom and explore. But we also know loons will forage as a group. They'll forage so socially. So we call this flock foraging or group foraging. And if you're out there looking for it, you see it. And I was doing some research off the coast of Louisiana and we came across like several rafts, six to 10 miles in the ocean with 10, 20, 30, 40 birds. And in this case, these birds are making shallow dives and we surmise they're feeding on schooling fish, right? Uh, uh, alewives, silver sides, menhaden, because we see these small fish jumping out of the water as the loons are flocking and chasing them. So that's probably something new you may not have known about loons, that they will forage together socially. And there's some interesting things in this picture that maybe at the end of the talk we, we can come back to. There's several things here of interest. So I wanna share one story with you that Darwin was out in the Gulf of Mexico and came across a flock of loons that was so spectacular. We surmised there were six, over 600 individuals in this one flock. So can you imagine, come, we all love loons, right? Oh, I get to see one loon, that's awesome, two loons. Can you imagine get to see 600 loons? Like that's crazy. Uh, so we published that because we thought that was quite noteworthy at the time. And then this was again, probably about 10 miles out in the ocean. So again, if you're not looking for this, you're missing it, right? And let me throw something about this as well, is when these large flocks are happening, pelicans join in. Uh, Northern gannets, another water bird that feeds on fish will join in. Terns, gulls, other birds will come in and join this multi-species flock kind of feeding on schooling fish. And that's something that I feel very fortunate to have been able to see in the winter time. And in the bottom, I just highlighted that in South Carolina where I've been studying loons, I have a population on a freshwater reservoir that 35% of the time, they are next to another loon, they are social. So we think of them as being solitary, but in the winter time in certain situations, I've noticed sociality can be quite high. Okay, I can't see everybody. I only have another hundred slides to go. We're good, right? Thumbs up, we'll just give thumbs up. We'll just keep on going. All right, hopefully you're learning some interesting things. So we have data sheets uh, and we try to watch birds for one hour. So we do time activity budgets. Where for one hour, we score their behavior. We have multiple people looking at the loon. We're watching whether it's resting, foraging, foraging underwater. We're recording dive times. Are there other loons nearby? Are they calling? So we're recording all this. And then you can make a pie chart and break down these data. And it allows us to use it as a comparative approach. So what are the loons doing off the coast of Maine compared to South Carolina, Louisiana, California? And I've yet to even put all these data together, but we're starting to see a little bit of a story. So I've been able to take SJC students to South Carolina multiple times. And we have a project now off the coast of Maine where I have several students involved helping me gather data on the loons in the wintertime. 
Uh, just for people who put swag together for St. Joe's College, how about a nice winter's down jacket that says SJC? I'll be the first one to get it. Okay, so now we're gonna compare Loons in Louisiana, which I watched for seven years off the coast of Maine for three years. And let's look at these time activity budgets and do we notice any differences? So the next picture shows it differently. We kind of have kind of a, uh, a chart in terms of a bar chart. And we can see, for example, in terms of foraging, the loons in Louisiana forage 68% of their time. And in Maine, it's 53% of the time. So there's something going on. And what I suspect is happening is in Maine, the water's clear, they're able to see food quite readily, and they can meet their foraging needs quicker, and they spend more time resting. Well, in Louisiana, I should preface this, the water's quite turbid, it's near the mouth of this Mississippi. Loons can't see as well, they're visual predators, and I think as a consequence, they have to spend more time foraging. This is looking at comparison of the number of prey they bring to the surface. And what's really surprised me when I was in Louisiana were how many crabs they bring to the surface. And so looking at the data, it's like 1.5 per hour and fish were 0.4 per hour. And remember, if it's a small fish, they're gonna swallow it underwater. So it's only really a large fish they're gonna to bring to the surface. But so what surprised me is that off the coast of Maine, they're bringing prey to the surface of crab 1.8 times per hour. So they're catching more crabs in Maine than they are in Louisiana. In South Carolina, where I'm working, it's, it's zero. So off the coast of Maine, it seems they feed on a fair number of crab just as they do in Louisiana. So in other words of looking at this, if you were to watch the loons between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. during the day, literally 1.8 times per surface per hour, they would surface with a crab. Okay, so this graph, I promised you some behavioral data and hopefully it's not too complex, but I'm looking at the behavior differences between solitary loons and social loons. So when I'm out in the ocean and I see a solitary loon, I score its behavior. When I see a loon in a group, and this, these are groups of five or more when they're acting socially, I try to score their behavior. and been doing this multiple, multiple times. And what we find is that we look at the time foraging as a group or as a solitary individual. We find solitary individuals are foraging you know, over 60% of the time. Group foraging, you're able to meet your needs and catch your fish, all the fish you need, probably 35% of the time. So you're much more efficient being in a school of other loons, being in a flock of loons, attacking a schooling fish if those conditions exist. And then that gives them more time to rest and actually gives it more time to preen. So the loon can take care of itself. So I'm wondering, again, how loons fare over winter that forage socially in groups compared to solitary. So we're generating a list of questions, right? We all have that going, that's awesome. And we're just about nearing the end here. So the other thing we looked at was dive duration. So a solitary loon, now this actually should, should clarify, this is in one population in South Carolina I was working. These loons dove for 69 seconds on average. And if you were in a group, you dove for 23 seconds. So in terms of foraging strategy, groups were taking many numerous shallow dives and solitary loons were probably plummeting quite deep into the water column. And I noticed something interesting when I was watching groups of loons is they would call each other, hoot, hoot, hoot. They would give little hoots. And it's, this is a communication call. And solitary loons would rarely call per hour, but group, groups of loons, I would hear hoots all the time. And I think that's a communication piece is to help group cohesion for everybody to stay together. And should one loon see some schooling fish, Others might join in. Uh, and that's probably what accounts for the high prevalence of the call rate. Okay, I just have a couple slides left near the conclusion. I wanna recognize my graduate student at University of Southern Maine, Igor Malenko. 
who's worked tirelessly for a couple of years gathering data on loons in the wintertime. Uh, very challenging conditions. He did a lot of interesting work. I'll share with you just a few things that Igor came up with. And I have to give Igor credit for this. This was an interesting thought he had, was that there's a dominance hierarchy in loons. So if there's a particular foraging area along the coast, the adult's gonna claim it first. Some adults have to come after the adults. And when he brought that to my attention, I was a little dubious, but the more I've looked for it, there's definitely a dominance hierarchy in loons. And it would be interesting to know if there's a difference between males and females. Males are larger than females. And that's just some of the other questions that remain unknown about loons. And what Igor's master's thesis was looking at is numbers of loons along the coast. And what we found is along the river mouths, so like the Nunsuch, the Androscoggin, and the Saco River, you know, we would typically see as many as 10 loons in a group. And away from those areas, you know, we were lucky to see two or three loons. So if you wanna see loons, go to the mouth of any of these major rivers, and you're literally guaranteed of finding loons at the mouths of these rivers. And then we were wondering if tide influenced numbers of loons. And so the RNM is no river mouth and RM stands for river mouth, river mouth. And then looking at this table, O is outcoming tide, low tide, incoming tide, high tide. And we were just looking at numbers of loons. And what we were able to find literally was, uh, was no difference either in behavior or numbers of loons. That we didn't really see a tidal influence effect. We thought we would. Yeah, and that's, of course, why you generate hypotheses and you gather science, gather data and see if, you're, if your kind of hypothesis is supported. But we weren't able to see any differences. And I think this is my penultimate slide for you. There's an interesting sexual dimorphism between males and females in loons. So on, these are states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York, New Hampshire, and Maine. And what you find is females get larger males get larger as you get closer to the coast. And within each pair, males are larger than females by 20 to 25%, in some cases 30%. And to give you an idea, this Wisconsin male, 4,550 grams, that's roughly a 10 pound loon. So what we're saying is that in New Hampshire and Maine, female loons are about 10 pounds, and male loons are probably 13 pounds, 13 or 14 pounds. And I was out with Dave Evers, executive director at Biodiversity Research Institute. And we actually caught this loon together, 7,600 grams. And these are the largest loons in North America. So Dave Evers and his crew have been catching loons throughout North America. I've helped assist part-time in some of that endeavor. And what we find throughout Alaska loons, Washington, the heaviest loons are in Maine. And they're even, even heavier than those that were in uh, Iceland that we've caught, for example. So that kind of wraps up what I had to say. I know I went a little fast at times. Uh, hopefully you were able to follow along. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody for showing up to learn about loons. And you know, something I'll add is the more I research loons, the more I realize I don't know, right? I, I've generated more research questions now and I probably know less about loons now than when I did 10 years ago, to be honest with you. And I'm looking forward to the next 10 years to keep learning about loons. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit out there that's left to unravel and unveil. And I hope to be a part of that and, and keep our SJ students involved with it as we go along the way. So Joanne, that's kind of my introduction. Thank you. Hope I didn't Jim. go too long. No, that was fabulous. Thank you. We have a few questions. So sure. I'm just going to toss them your way if you could address them, please. So um, we have a question um, that was generated from Becky. Um, Becky wants to know what is the lifespan of a loon? Yeah, that's a great question, Becky. And that's one of the reasons why we have to put bands on these birds, right? is one loon looks like the next loon, which looks like the next loon, right? And so as much as I would like to be hands off with biology, sometimes we need to be involved with the birds and putting these bands on them allows us to track them over time. 
And this really started in the late 1980s in uh, upper Michigan. And Dave was out there catching a loon in 1989. And that loon was probably already four or five years old when he banded it. And I was with Dave the following year out to that local site. So that loon that was banded in, let's say 1989, is 11, is 31 years old. And as of last year, it's, it still came back. And we know it takes about five years to reach a place where you can get your own breeding location. So our best guess is that loon is 35 or 36 years old. We have a couple of other loons that are 30 years old. So we know loons get to be 30 to 35 years old. The question is, are they gonna live much older? Now, to put that in perspective, there's some owls that are 30, 35 years old, and there's some albatrosses that might live 50 or 60 years to give you an idea for longevity. And of course, parrots in captivity, you know, might live 70 or 80 years. Mm -hmm. So great question. Okay, great, thank you. And a question coming from Ruby. Ruby wants to know, do loons change color in the winter? And how does that, what do they look like in the winter? Yeah, so what we see here, so the, if you can look at the slide I'm looking at here, this is a loon that's in the winter time. And you can see it's lost predominantly it's black and white markings. It's lost its, its collar on the neck. And so they molt those feathers, their entire body feathers as well. So at this time, they become more uniformly gray and drab, not the checkered black and white that we see in the breeding grounds. So hopefully that helps. Okay, and then a question from Steve who lives on Little Sebago Lake. He said, it seems that the loons start returning as soon as the ice begins to recede. Are they likely checking things out, planning to make their permanent return for the summer, or are they just here and for a little stay? Well, I'm gonna see if I, I understand Steve's question in the beginning, but I think what you mentioned, Joanne, was that in the spring, Steve would see loons uh, coming back. Was yeah. that correct? So they're returning um, when the ice begins to recede. Oh, and sure, absolutely. yep. And so what's happening in that situation is I think there's intense pressure for loons to kind of establish a territory. And there seems almost to be like a competition because these loons, literally as soon as ice is out, there's a loon seems to be occupy the place. And so what Steve probably recognizes is that they're trying to get ahead of their competition and so a loon's gonna come back to a territory, it's gonna establish itself, but there might be another loon that's also trying to establish a territory. So resident loons from the previous years, there's incentive to get back as quick as they can. And sometimes from the ocean, they might make scouting trips. So to give you an idea, let's say you have a loon on the ocean, Saco Lake, Saco River at the mouth of the Saco, and it's gonna to fly to Little Sebago. Loons fly roughly 75 miles per hour. So literally, it probably can make that trip in an hour and 20 minutes, get to Little Sebago, check it out. If there's open water, it can stay. If not, it can turn around and just go back to the ocean. So they probably are doing these reconnaissance flights that might take one or two hours just to ensure when that lake water body opens that they're there. Okay, and another question coming from Robert, who I know has family in Belgrade Lakes, and he wants to know, where do you think the loons come from that winter in South Carolina and Louisiana? Yeah, that's a great question. And I have a picture. I, I can't remember if, um, let me see if I have this for you. Yes, can you see that, Joanne? Yes. So great question. And through banding data and satellite telemetry data, what we found is that the birds that are up in upper Midwest, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, they fly predominantly to the Gulf of Mexico. So as highlighted in this map, and a certain subset of them fly to the Eastern seaboard off you know, South Carolina, for example, as well. So in off uh, Georgia. So Midwest loons fly literally 1500 miles in contrast to loons here in New England that might have to fly 100, 150 miles. So it's a difference of tenfold between flying from Maine, New England to these Midwest loons. And that brings up an interesting extension is loons from the Midwest have to be smaller because they're flying such a long distance, they're trying to reduce their mass. 
So to use an, anal an analogy, if it's helpful, uh, let's say you're running up a hill and you got two people and someone's 50 or half a hundred pounds heavier, let's say myself and I'm running against my daughter, but ideally it would be the same age. I'm having a harder time going up that hill because I weigh more, right? It's a harder effort. And similarly, a heavy set loon flying a long distance is proportionally harder, all things being equal. So there's selection for loons to be smaller in the upper Midwest because they migrate such long distances. Hey, great questions, Joanne. Interesting, so we have a few more. So Sharon wants to know how many loons were tracked in the two telemetry studies that identified Northeast loons winter's growth? Yeah, so the one from that map that we looked at, there was one earlier, did we just put out six satellite transmitters? So the ones in Maine was this very small sample size. Part of it is because of cost, it's ex expensive to get that. And so those data, even though are preliminary, we have some banding data, which helps extend things for us. But, uh, and then the other study, I think in New England, Kevin Kenow probably put out another 12 or 15 satellite transmitters. So in total, we only have literally 20 loons with satellite transmitters that really give us the high resolution. So that tells us there's still more to learn, of course, about the connection between breeding and wintering grounds. So there's still more that could be done in that area. Okay, and another question coming from Bonnie, wanting to know what's the factor that contributes to the variability in weight by region? Yeah, so the, that's a great question. So again, when, when you're looking at body weight, it correlates with migration distance. So the longer and further you migrate, the smaller the loon is. And for example, so I'm gonna take you over in this map here to Washington and Puget Sound. The loons here in this Olympic Peninsula and even in Eastern Washington, they winter mostly in Puget Sound. So again, loons on the West Coast in Washington are the heaviest loons, where those in Idaho and for example, those in Montana are migrating really long distances. And so they're proportionally smaller. So the longer the distance you travel, you migrate, the smaller your body size. All righty. And this is an interesting question. I certainly want to know about this. A loon chick was taken by an eagle on our lake this summer, and it was about three months old and quite large. How old or large uh, is a loon to be safe from eagles? Are they ever safe, Jim? Boy, that's a great question. I love it. Uh, keep them coming. Hmm. Uh, hopefully this is uh, informative and it's great for me to, to hear this as well. So, I'm trying to check my database, which is my memory stick, right? We all know about that memory stick. And I saw a loon chick get killed by eagles. I think it was like in the late 1990s. And, and as I'm scratching my head, in 1997, I saw an adult loon land on the back of an eagle while it was incubating its nest. So going back to the question, at what size or what age is a chick or is an adult even safe? I think we can argue it's, it's probably never safe, right? And based on that. So an adult in the water is mostly fine. I think when an adult is incubating on the nest, it's vulnerable to eagle predation. And we've seen ex episodes of that, like I saw that, for example. So in the water, a loon, that's alert, we'll, we'll be able to dive and easily avoid being predated. And once an eagle sank its talons on it, that would be pretty challenging because what would it do with it? Now a chick, however, you know, is still considerably smaller. And so a chick, even up to six weeks of age, potentially or eight weeks of age could be vulnerable. But what we've noticed is loon chicks get older, uh, they, they're, whether they're more alert or not, but they certainly can dive quicker and faster. They respond quicker to external stimuli. So a chick that's six or eight weeks old is probably pretty safe. So what we found is when we're monitoring a loon family, in the first two weeks, you might lose one. It could be to uh, snapping turtle predation, uh, a large fish, a bass predation, uh, bald eagle predation. But once a chick gets to about six weeks of age, it's going to make it. 
So for that point, it's, it's large enough to avoid those other predators. And for the most part, it's observant enough and quick enough to avoid getting caught by an eagle. So in summary, adults are mostly free in the water from predation. On the nest, they're still vulnerable. They need to be attentive. And the young up to about four weeks are most vulnerable. And what we find is that six week is a critical time that the loon's probably gonna make it if it makes it to six weeks old, the chick. All righty. Another question from Suzanne is why do female and male loons winter in different places? Yeah, that's a great question. And I didn't really point that out too much in my slide. So I'm glad uh, she detected that as well is we put satellite transmitters in the same individuals and I'll try not to, so let's, let's get our bearings on this. So Flagstaff Lake, for example, here, this was, I believe the same, the same individual, or this was the Ziskahas, no, it was Flagstaff. So in Flagstaff, we caught the same pair male and female on the same, same time. Now, very fortunate. This is where the male spent the entire winter on Flagstaff. And this is where the female spent the entire time. So this is pretty solid data that suggests males and females winter in different locations, which brings up the question uh, that the call, kind of the caller wrote in about is why are males and females in different spots? Ah, that's great. Uh, really good observation, great question. One thing Another I might throw questions. out there. Do loons have the same mate? And if so, um, can you share a little bit about that? And what about uh, the band that you put on loons? How do you catch them and band them, Jim? Yep, and um, I'm gonna, let me finish up this one question real quick. And I wasn't sure if uh, you were able to hear me, but we think males and females are in different locations, maybe to reduce competition. Okay. And because they winter in different places, they don't form a seasonal, it's, it's more seasonal partnerships. So they're together for like four months of the year. And because of that, they're not wedded to each other year round, let's say a geese or a swan would be. So because of that, which brings in the question about do they mate for life, is there's turnover with, within mates. So what we find with loons is they pair together, you know, on average, for about six years. So it's almost like seasonal monogamy. We're together for about six years and then the pair turns over. There's some perturbation, for example, and they end up going their separate ways. Usually it might be a nest failure that happens or it might be consecutive nest failures, in which case then they'll, they'll probably separate. And something that strikes me to share with, with people as well is that the value of forming partnerships is you become more efficient and you save time. And those of us who are parents and raise kids, right? If, if you work together and you cooperate and you know your roles and your routines, it's a little easier to raise two kids with both parents. You just, you have your rituals. And the same thing I think with loon pairs is the value of staying together is you know each other and you can pair sooner in the year. You know how to look for predators. You know where the nest is. New partnerships are not as successful. So stable partnerships produce more young year after year than new partnerships. So it behooves each partner to stay with each other longer than less time together. And it seems about six years seems to be about the point tipping point, for example. So hopefully that takes care of a couple questions. Mm -hmm. And again, in terms of banding loons at night, just to reiterate, we do it at night. We've tried catching loons during the day and it's laughable. You know, Henry David Thoreau wrote about it in his book on Walden, about the loon surfacing all these different places. I have the same problem. I, I have no idea where the loon's going to be. And during the day, I could never get close to a loon. So going at night, they're restful, they're sleeping. It allows us to approach them quietly. You know, we kind of have a trolling motor and we approach them very slowly. And with luck, we're able to scoop them up. Very interesting. So another question, how do you expect climate change to change wintering habits of loons in Maine? Yeah, that's a very astute question. 
and one we wish as biologists we had the answers to. So what I'll throw out there with you is that loons are gonna be where the food is. So if the food is there, that's where you're gonna find loons. And if you look at the distribution of loons along the coastlines, it's where food is concentrated. So in this case, schooling fish might be a priority, for example. So if climate change is gonna disrupt anything in the food chain, if it's going to affect the distribution of fish, that's how I feel loons will respond is it may alter where loons distribution would be if it changes the fish that they're feeding on their distribution. And it's, there's more to learn with that, but I think that's probably what might happen if climate change shifts distributions of fish, we might see loons shift as well. All right, Jim, and there's a couple questions and then a really important one that we want you to end with. So one of the questions is, Basically, um, can you share a little bit of, about how long it takes for their flight feathers to grow back? And do loons have to winter in salt water? And then of course, we want you to tell us a little bit about your book before you close. Uh, there's been some questions relative to the new book that's being published and will be available in May. Awesome, so great question in terms of the molt, it seems like it takes about two to three weeks for the wing molt to take place. And what we've learned is it doesn't start at the same time every year for every individual. So there was a picture that I had at some point, and I, I don't know whether to, uh, if you can trust my brain, if this doesn't give you guys a tremendous headache, let me see if this works for me. This one, remember I told you about this picture? What I love about this picture is it shows you loons at different stage of the molt. Same time, same snapshot. Some, this one's starting to get black in its cheek, for example. This one's already turning. This one, darker head. And so loons will molt, but over a period of two, three weeks, and they don't start at the same time. It depends on their body condition, their health, how they're feeling. So it takes roughly two to three weeks to kind of take care of that question. And then another interesting question with climate change is do they need to winter in the marine environments? You know, absolutely not. If Sebago Lake stays open and fish are here, a loon, some loons might like, well, maybe I don't need to go. Uh, Lake Champlain in Vermont, ah, large water body may not freeze. So Lake, the, the Great Lakes in Michigan, maybe I don't need to, loo, to leave. And where I was studying loons in South Carolina, it's on a freshwater reservoir. So they don't need to go to the ocean, but I think the reason they do as well is because there's a fair amount of food there that keeps them well fed. So hopefully those answer those questions for you and it's been, uh, it's been great. The, um, just real briefly, the Loon book that's coming out, a friend just texted me and said it's available. On, well, you can pre-order it on Amazon is what they said. Great. But um, I think I have a picture of the book cover called Loon Lessons. And this summarizes literally my 27 years of studying loons. Each chapter starts with a story that I had to kind of pull you into the book. And what I really tried to do as I did in this talk today is just lead you through what we've learned about loons and kind of put it in some ecological evolutionary context. And hopefully it's an enjoyable reading and I will say putting it together, anyone who's written a book, it's, it's, it's painful. It is not easy to sit there day after day after day to write, but at the end of the day, you can feel pretty good about your product and, and hope people will learn about this wonderful bird that shares our landscape with us. Well, great, Jim. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for participating. Just thinking that uh, one of the questions was um, assuming some of these points are referencing loons in the summer as well. So we're gonna have to have you back and talk specifically about what happens to loons in the summer. Might be perfect timing for the book, um, but we thank you so much for joining us. Uh, also wanna just thank our audience and please stay tuned to Front Row with the faculty here at St. Joseph's College. We have our sessions uh, the second and fourth Wednesday of every month. And so next month is going to be Wednesday, February 10th. And the topic is servant leadership in senior living during a pandemic. So servant leadership in senior living during a pandemic. And that'll be by uh, a professor on our online, uh, Shana Eckberg. 
So uh, you'll be registering the same way and it'll be publicized the same way. And we wish you all a wonderful evening. Thanks for joining us at St. Joseph's College of Maine. Thanks everyone.